pray you graciously to behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Believe what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors, Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known, made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we also have obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance for its redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Judean guards arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Judean leaders that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside of the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now the slaves and the guards had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, where all the Judeans come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Judean leaders replied, We, we are not permitted to, to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Judeans? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Judean, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Judeans. But as, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Judean leaders again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Judeans? They shouted in reply, Not, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. And Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, Hail King, King of the Judeans, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Judean leaders answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Judean leaders cried out, 
If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gamatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Judean leaders, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Judeans. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Judeans said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Judeans, but this man said, I am the King of the Judeans. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Judean leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of the scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. Here ends the reading. Jesus being taken to Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate. 
Peter, warming himself by the fire while chillingly betraying his friend. Soldiers crowned with scorns, and Dogata, the skull, the cross. In two breathtaking chapters, we go from the garden to the tomb. It's a story that calls for silence and sadness, solemnity and swift altars. But in John's hands, it is also a story about glory. In John's gospel, Jesus is lifting up on the cross is also his exaltation. Just before the spread from the garden to the grave, John tells us Jesus prayed this, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that, so that your Son may glorify you. John's gospel begins with the glory of the Word. He says, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a Father and only Son. The glory of the enfleshed Word is the glory that now radiates from the exalted Jesus on the cross. John leaves out most of what makes the passion terrifying in the other Gospels. Jesus doesn't pray that this cup would pass from him. He is not distressed, sorrowful, or troubled. He certainly does not sweat blood. He is not mocked by the bystanders as he hangs on the cross. The sun is not darkened. The curtain of the temple is not torn. There is no earthquake. Jesus does not cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Instead, Jesus is completely composed. Jesus says, It is finished. Jesus is so composed that in the midst of beatings and mockery, he can pause to have theological debates with Pilate. <laughs> in John, the cross is glory. The cross is radiance. The cross is the beauty of God shining forth from the ugliness of execution. Yes. And if we are not careful, this way of telling the story can paper over the human, literary, theological, relational pain and struggle and confusion that rumbles around at the foot of the cross. If we are not careful, John's passion narrative can make it all look easy. Nothing seems complicated, confusing, or out of place. Everything unfolds according to a plan. <clears throat> no fewer than six times, John tells us that something happened in order to fulfill the scriptures. This ending was quite literally scripted. John's passion doesn't ask us to linger in Jesus' suffering or to ponder what it would mean for the Word made flesh to die a brutal death. I recently heard an interview uh, with the poet Mary Oliver from back in 2015, and she was asked to describe her spiritual life as a child. She said, I was sent to Sunday school, as many kids are, and then I had trouble with the resurrection, so I would not go into church. But I was still probably more interested than many, than many of the kids who did enter the church. It's been one of the most important interests of my life and continues to be. I can understand why Mary Oliver had trouble with the resurrection. Her gift is to pay close attention to the natural world and then describe it back to the rest of us so that we can see things we might otherwise have missed. And at times, this leads to beautiful and hopeful lines and stanzas that can be put on inspirational posters. <laughs> but at other times, Oliver pays attention to things that are less glorious and less uplifting. One of her poems, What Can We Do About God? looks straight at death and then straight at God. What can we do about God? who makes and then breaks every God-forsaken beautiful day. What can we do about all those graves in the woods and old pastures and small towns and valleys of cities? God's heavy footsteps through the bracken, through the bog, through the dark wood, his breath like a swollen river, his switch locking the flowers. Forgive me, Lord, how I still sometimes crave understanding. The God of this poem creates beauty and breaks it, causes the flowers to bloom and locks them off all in a day. Every day is made beautiful by God, and every day is broken and God forsaken. 
I had trouble with the resurrection. I like her honesty. And as a close observer of the world with all its death and all its endings, she wasn't going to act like resurrection was anything but impossible. Things die and other things are born. The death of one thing feeds the soil of new life. The cycle, this cycle, she observes well and with wonder. But this is not resurrection. This is the perennial cycle of living and dying. It may be that Oliver is right, and we should all have trouble with the resurrection. Maybe our deep familiarity with the Easter story makes it hard for us to find the resurrection startling. Maybe we are not paying enough attention, not looking closely enough at the bogs, the dark wood, the swollen rivers, and all those graves. It may mean that we've made the impossible seem natural, even easy. Oliver is right, I think, at least in this, that God makes breakable beauty. And denying that it is breakable will never get us to the resurrection. That's why I think it's important that we read John's passion alongside Isaiah's description of the suffering servant whose appearance was so marred, even beyond human semblance, that he startled the nation. He had no form or majesty. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. He carried our diseases. He was struck down by God and afflicted. He was bruised, slaughtered, crushed with pain. Isaiah does not hold back in his descriptions of the suffering of the righteous one. And in a rich but dangerous hermeneutical mood, we read this typologically as a description of the suffering of Jesus. It is rich because it provides an important counterpoint to John's poised and unflattering of Jesus. It is dangerous because such typology can serve to wrench a text like Isaiah out of the hands of his Jewish readers with the implication that this is really about Jesus and nothing else. But there is a way to read this text, such that it can maintain its integrity as Hebrew scripture, maintain its ability to describe a moment of deep suffering in Israel's story, and also, when read through a Christian lens, can point to another story, the suffering of another righteous one of Israel. Jesus' passion, when framed by both John and Isaiah, displays the glory and fragility of God, the glory and fragility of the creature. In the stage directions to his play, The Last Menagerie, Tennessee Williams gives instructions about him at, at the recurring musical theme. He says it should be music that, quote, expresses the surface vivacity of life with the underlying strain of immutable and inexpressible sorrow. When you look at a piece of delicately spun glass, he says, you think of two things, how beautiful it is and how easily it can be broken. Both of these ideas should be woven into the recurring theme. When we look at the cross with John and Isaiah, we might come away saying how beautiful it is and how easily it The story of the passion is the story of beauty broken. It is the story of the one who said, I am the life now defeated by death. It is a story of glory, but it is a story of fragile glory. And at least at this point in the Trinity, it is a story of defeated glory. We come into this space today with our own sense of fragility and defeat. Our own losses, our own sadnesses our own worries, and our own anxieties. Some of them are mundane. An assignment coming due, a work task, a task that is solved and frustrating. Kids who think that doing dishes is an unreasonable request. Some, though, are profound. Post-graduation plans, a broken relationship, fears about global crises, questions about calling. All of these we bring to the cross. All of our suffering, big and small, are welcome, are not diminished, are not too quickly solved by theological answers. 
and not smothered by that glory that denies heartburn. Soon, we will pray for people everywhere according to their needs, for the church, for the nations and authorities, for the suffering and afflicted, for those without the hope of faith. We bring all the world's hurts and worries to the cross today. It's not a day to answer them or fix them. It's a day to sit with them and wonder about them and be confused by them. What can we do about God, who makes and then breaks every God-forsaken beautiful day, including perhaps especially this day? We can trust that beneath the brokenness of beauty, we can stand alongside each other as fellow travelers with sufferings that are not unfamiliar to one another. We can dare to pray with Mary Oliver, forgive me, Lord, how I still sometimes crave understanding. And we can wait and hope for the impossible resurrection.
For Michael, presiding bishop, the bishops of the Diocese of Texas, and for the bishops of our students. For all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve. For all Christians in this community. For those about to be baptized throughout the world this Easter. Spirit, the whole body, and their faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplication and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For the Congress and the Supreme Court. For the members and representatives of the United Nations.
for all who serve the common good. your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So let us pray for all the Jewish people who possess an eternal covenant with the Lord, who delivered them from bondage through freedom. For continued faithfulness to God's covenant with them. Fullness of redemption for the sake of God's name. As we see a concord basis between Jews and Christians, it all begins to God's will. God of Abraham, you planted your people Israel as the root and grafted Gentiles as wild branches into a single olive tree of praise to you. As we come near to the cross, with our men's Christian acts of prejudice and violence against your faithful people, of whom Jesus Christ was born. Bless the children of your covenant so that together we may attain the fullness of your blessing for the world. The 
those who are ill or disabled in body, mind, or spirit. For those in loneliness, fear, and anguish. those who face temptation, doubt, and despair. For those who are sorrowful and bereaved. those who are persecuted for the sake of Christ. For prisoners, refugees, and captives. victims of war, genocide, and trafficking, and all those in mortal danger. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord.
for those who have lost their faith. pardoned by sin or indifference. contemptuous and the scornful. those who are persecutors of Christ's disciples. those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others. God, the source of life and fountain of mercy, let the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, be preached with grace and love. Turn the hearts of the followers of Jesus who found others in his name. Lead all to repentance and amendment of life, and sustain by your loving grace all who lift their eyes to you. God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, 
carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
judge of our hearts, let us now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray for you to see your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God, now and forever. 